Okay, uh, homework seven is due on Monday. And um, another announcement that I'd like to make, and it's included on the next slide, is that there's some software that you need to download and have installed on your computer for us to begin using after spring break. So, of course, we've got class next week, and then the week after that is spring break. And we'll start using WMS after spring break. And so I'll email you this link for the Aquaveo WMS software. And you should have it installed for uh, Monday, March 21st. It's only available for PC. So if you've got the Apple computer, you'll have to run it in an emulator to be able to get it to work. Let me show you just a, a brief view of their website. This Aquaveo company is a, uh, a software company that's actually a spin-off from a university. Um, at the university, they've developed several different modeling softwares that are based on the movement of water. One of them, this is the movement of water through watersheds, WMS. They also have a software called SMS, which is for surface water. And it has to do mostly a flow through rivers. And then there's GMS, which is subsurface flow. It's the movement of water through aquifers and the underground environment. Um, so this Aquaveo has a uh, free trial. And uh, even without implementing the free trial, you can run what they call the community mode, which allows you to connect to servers and download data and look at watersheds. But I'm going to be giving you a, a license key that will unlock um, a broader range of tools. And uh, we're going to be using this. Um, what it is is a, um, it's known as a preprocessor and a post-processor because um, watershed modeling system itself isn't, um, they didn't develop the models that are doing the hydrologic calculations. The models were developed by the um, Army Corps of Engineers, the National Co uh, Resource Conservation Service, mostly government agencies. And all Aquaveo does is allows you to connect to GIS data that will, for example, streamline the process that you'd need to undertake to calculate curve number. Whereas if there wasn't something like WMS available, you'd have to use some really complicated, expensive, confusing GIS software to be able to calculate the curve number. Or if you needed to download data that describes like the surface slope of the land. Again, a complicated process that this makes so much easier. So as a preprocessor, what it's doing is it's making it easier to fill in all the blanks that have to be known to prepare a watershed model. And so it gets all of that data ready, and then it puts it into this really strange format that the watershed, watershed models require. Uh, a lot of the watershed models were programmed back in the 70s and 80s. And uh, the fundamentals of hydrology have evolved a little bit. But um, in a lot of cases, those same models are still appropriate based on the data that's available. I mean, the more sophisticated models that were developed in the 90s and the 2000s, oftentimes they'll allow you to do a really sophisticated watershed model, but it can be a struggle to get the data you need for those more sophisticated modern techniques whereas the data is pretty widespread for the older ones. But the thing about those older models is that they operated on the basis of text files. And so you had to basically, in the old days, open up a, uh, a word processor or notepad and just put text in the right order. And it was just uh, incredibly cumbersome and really prone to error. And this kind of takes the guesswork out of it because it will take the data that you go out and gather, and it will format all the information into that special text file. And then it passes off that text file to the underlying hydrologic model, which was made by the Army Corps or the USDA. And then it runs the model. And then the post-processor aspect of what this Aquaveo software does is it reads the output. Because again, those old models kind of gave pretty lame output. Another text file that is just line after line of nearly indecipherable data, whereas Aquaveo is able to read that nearly indecipherable data and turn it into some pretty meaningful visual results like hydrographs, which is what we really want to see is for our watershed, what does the runoff hydrograph look like? So WMS 
is a tool that does that. And ordinarily, the software is really expensive. If we look at the, the pricing for it, you're talking about seven to ten thousand dollars for the premium license, and that's per seat. Um, but luckily, what we'll be using is I think we've got the floodplain license, and of course, they make it available for a, a pretty nice discount for academic institutions. So we did have to pay; it's not free, but it adds on some additional features that aren't available on the free community model. But if you want to get an early start, just poking around with the software, you can. Uh, install it in community mode, but I'll I'll send you the license string that you need to put it into the more sophisticated floodplain mode, and then you can go ahead and get it installed. All right, so that's just a preview of things to come after spring break. Things are really going to get applied around here. You're going to be uh, spending a lot of time in class working through different activities that I've developed. And so it's going to be less lecture, and I'll give you handouts that you kind of just step by step working with some data, um, learning the different tools that WMS makes available. Any questions for now about either the uh, homework schedule or course schedule or WMS announcement? All right. As a refresher, the NRCS model is a way of figuring out what the rainfall excess depth is. And it depends on us characterizing the curve number for a watershed. And the curve number we can get from a table. And the tables that I showed you last time are typical curve numbers. So, you know, where you could look up for a different soil type what kind of curve number is going to correspond to one acre residential lots, for example. You know, these curve numbers are for kind of middle of the road moisture conditions. But, you know, it's not always going to be middle of the road moisture conditions. And so one of the things we'll talk about today is how we can take into account some of the uh, unique circumstances that may change the curve number that we put into the NRCS method. So antecedent moisture condition is one, and then the other factor that we'll be talking about today is unconnected impervious area. So let's talk about the antecedent moisture classes to begin, sometimes abbreviated AMC, though it's not the stock that maybe you own. Uh, this antecedent moisture condition is a way of adjusting curve numbers. We have these curve number adjustment equations where the input value, curve number two, is the curve number that you get from these table. So these are all curve number two conditions. These curve numbers are what you'd expect for that kind of middle of the road moisture condition. And what the antecedent moisture class adjustments say is that um, if you have relatively dry conditions, that puts you into group one. AMC group one. And so you can see that it varies depending on whether you're in the dormant season or the growing season. So around here, uh, we could think of the dormant season as anytime the leaves are off the trees. And then the growing season is when the trees are leafed out, when there's vegetation, and where um, the, the differentiation between the two is that if this is all about the total amount of rainfall that's occurred in the last five days, there's a higher amount of rainfall during the growing season because there's more moisture that's being removed from the top layer of soil by plants and trees and grasses and so on. So during the, uh, during the growing season, even if you have 1.4 inches of rainfall in the last five days, you could still think of the soil as being pretty dry. If it's warm out, the sun is beating down on the surface, it could dry out the soil even if there was 1.4 inches or less. Whereas during the, uh, the dormant season where there's less heat that's getting onto the surface and less of the plant growth drawing moisture out of the soil pores, then uh, 0.5 inches is kind of the threshold for whether we consider the soil to be relatively dry. Now, condition two 
is the middle of the road. And so what do we consider middle of the road for curve numbers is that when there's been between 1.4 and 2.1 inches. So when you're using the NRCS method and you're just trying to figure out how much runoff there's going to be and you use those curve numbers straight out of the table, what you're effectively assuming is that this is how much rainfall there's been in the last five days. And so if you want to simulate how the watershed would respond if there was more than 2.1 inches in the last five days, then you'd have to use this conversion to find the curve number under con con condition three. So CN with the three in the parentheses, that just means what's the effective curve number if the antecedent moisture condition is wet, meaning more than 2.1 inches of rain in the last five days. So there's nothing fundamental about these equations. It's just they've done their best to estimate what the effect of additional rainfall is. And, um, and of course, you know, there's limits to how good this approach is because over 2.1. So let's say you get 2.2 inches of rainfall and calculate the curve number from that in the last five days. So you'd have the same value for 2.2 inches as you would if there was seven inches in the last five days. Whereas we kind of instinctively know that um, things are going to be really different if you had seven inches of rain in the last few days compared to if there was just 2.2. I think the, uh, the main reason they're able to justify these thresholds is that um, most soils would be saturated if there was more than 2.1 inches of rainfall in the last five days. They'd still be saturated and just draining by gravity. And so the, uh, the dry condition, maybe what they're looking for there is a break point where the suction head is going to be quite a bit higher than when the middle range exists. And so think about the, uh, the curve of the wetting front as it makes its way down and where we have water content theta and there was the saturated water content when it's raining and we've got water at the surface then the shape of the wave the saturation wave in reality is something like this so here's our initial water content And then here's saturation. And so we, with the green apt expression, instead of having the curve, we just had it be binary where it was fully saturated and then the initial. But my suspicion is that what they're trying to do here in breaking up the antecedent moisture classes is try and find like a break point that in concept represents the soil pores being pretty much full and that would be the break point that corresponds to how much moisture is it going to make it so that the curve number is effectively just looking at only the effects of gravity infiltration and then some corresponding break point that would account for how much suction head and additional infiltration you're going to see when the conditions are really draw, uh, dry. All right. So to get some experience using these two different conversions and to show you what the range could be, let's say that we have a residential quarter acre lot on class B soil. And if we go to our typical residential quarter acre lot class B soil, that's where the 75 comes from, is from this table. So this is, we're saying antecedent moisture condition two middle of the road gives us a curve number of 75. So what I'd like you to get a sense for is what would the adjusted curve numbers be like if there's no rain in the past five days. So that would classify us as group one regardless of whether it's dormant or growing season. No rain is going to put you into group one. So here for the first one use the uh, the adjustment factor curve number one and then what would be the curve number if in July so we're presuming that that's the growing season here in the northern hemisphere it had rained three inches in the past five days okay so I'm gonna pause for a second give you a chance to uh, 
substitute into these two empirical equations. And I have to run upstairs and grab something off the copy machine that I forgot to get later, so earlier. I'll be right back. OK, so did you get in your calculations that this curve number of 75 would go down to 56 if it had been dry conditions in the past five days? and then is boosted up to 87 if it had been wet in the last five days. And probably you don't have an appreciation quite yet for how drastic this would be for a watershed, but once we start doing modeling with WMS, I mean, this is the difference between no runoff and an absolute flood. And so antecedent moisture conditions really um, have a big impact on the runoff you're likely to see in a watershed. So when you are trying to design a system to withstand the worst, uh, the worst case scenario, you'd want to make the adjustments for the wet conditions in the five days before your simulation. Um, all right, the next thing for us to talk about is how we find the composite curve number when there's more than one thing in a watershed. Because usually, watersheds um, have more than just a single soil type. They have more usually than just a single land use. And so uh, the approach to calculate the overall weighted average is to weight it on the basis of area. Not just a simple average, but an area weighted average. All right. So um, an area weighted average, what you do there is you'd multiply the curve number by the decimal expression of the percentage of that applicable area. So if we had, for example, a watershed that was 40% of some constituent that has a curve number of 83 and 25% of a constituent has a curve number of 80 and so on, you just multiply 0.4 by this, 0.25, by that, and so on. Add it all up, and then that would be the composite curve number. So just to get another touch of practice using the NRCS equation, let's use this example where once you've calculated the weighted curve number, you put it into the formula for storage. And then once you've calculated the storage, you can put it into the formula for rainfall excess. So again, I'll pause. and give you a moment to do these calculations. Okay, so the aerial average, aerial meaning area based, is uh, 86 for the composite curve number. And when you put that into the formula for storage, you should get that there's 1.628 inches of storage in this watershed. And so then a storm that has a depth of 6 inches will yield 4.41 inches of rainfall excess. So 4.41 inches. All right, any questions about composite curve numbers? So that's another thing. Oh, go ahead. Um, why is it whenever, like, how we have more than six inches, we don't use, like, the um, curve number for the third category? Like because, right, this storm is uh, all right now. It wasn't before the storm in question. And these, um, these depths are talking about storms that had occurred before the storm that you're simulating now. And so antecedent would be in the, the prior storm events. Good question. Are there others? So another thing that WMS does pretty nicely is it calculates these composite curve numbers. And uh, in a watershed that has 40 or 50 acres, there may end up being 60 or 70 different subunits that it's weighting, you know, because each different combination of land use and soil type will have its own applicable curve number and there's just lots of polygons in a watershed of where the soil's been characterized as one thing versus another. So 
without a GIS to, uh, to do the calculations for us, it would be pretty tedious. All right. Um, so composite curve numbers. Let's talk about the issue of impervious area. And what I mean by impervious area is uh, asphalt, pavement, roof area, of course. And if you have pervious surfaces, meaning like grass or soil, something that can absorb water, that's connected to impervious surfaces like this, then it's just as simple as that simple average that we, uh, the weighted area weighted average that we just calculated. Um, our book has a nomograph that, you know, rather than having to do the calculations yourself, what you could do is uh, use this figure to find out the composite curve number. So, for instance, here, if we had a pavement with a curve number of 98 and grass with a curve number of 60, and we wanted to find out the composite curve number, then what we could do is we could see that that's 30% of the area is impervious and it's directly connected to the outlet and that's an important thing is if this pavement is connected to the outlet directly then it's going to behave differently than if the uh, if the impervious surface is separated from the outlet but here it's connected directly so what we would say is 30 percent connected impervious so you go up from the 30 percent and then you would intersect with what is the curve number of the pervious area. And our, our pervious area has a curve number of 60. So we're going up from this 30% until we intersect the curve number of 60. And then you're going to the left and it would be 72 from that. So that 72 is the same thing that you'd get if you just quickly on your calculator multiplied 0.7 times 60 plus 0.3 times 98. So this, this isn't doing any kind of special, special like math in the background, any special consideration. This is just a figure that effectively is a weighted average based on the area. But things are a little bit different for unconnected impervious area. So this is definitely something you'll need to be able to describe on the next exam unconnected impervious area, just compare and contrast this watershed. So in the first case, the grass was upstream and the asphalt was downstream. Now think about, since the things have flipped, the path that water takes to get to the outlet and how that's different. In the first situation, the asphalt was connected directly to the outlet. So when rain fell on the asphalt, it flowed over the surface and it goes to the outlet and it flowed over an impervious surface. Now think about this case where you have an impervious area that's not connected to the outlet. What do you expect the water is going to do as it flows over the grassy portion of the watershed? It will contribute to saturation. Okay, contribute to saturation. That's true. What effect is it going to have on the overall amount of runoff? What can the water do? In other words, what can the water from in the impervious area do when it's in this green zone that it couldn't do when it was connected directly to the outlet? When it's connected directly to the outlet, the water only has one option for where it can go. Flow over the surface downstream towards the outlet. Now, the water that's running off of this impervious area has two options. It can flow over the surface, or what's the other choice? It can infiltrate into the pervious surface. And so unconnected impervious area takes into account the fact that the impervious section of the watershed isn't going to contribute to the outlet in the same way as it did when it was directly connected. So in other words, if we calculate a composite curve number, we have to somehow account for the fact that some of the water will infiltrate. Not all of it is going to remain at the surface. Even though 30% of the watershed is impervious, the water that comes from this portion of the watershed has some opportunity to infiltrate through the pervious section of the watershed. So we have a different nomograph. 
Let me hand you a copy of this nomograph. I've printed it out to make it easier for you to sketch on. Okay, so to illustrate how to use this um, nomograph, let's say that we've got the same example where the pavement section has a curve number of 98, the uh, grassy section has a curve number of 60, and it's, you can see from the, the areas that we have 30% impervious area. So. 100% of the impervious area is unconnected. So this curve is the curve that we'd use, the one on the bottom. The others would correspond to, hold on just for a second, let me jump to the next slide and show you. It, oops, sorry, don't see that. This is the one. Okay, so you can see here, some of the impervious area is unconnected and some of it is connected. So that's these other curves, is like if it was half and half, then you'd use this curve that goes along with 0.5, the ratio of unconnected to total impervious. But for this example, 100% of the impervious area is unconnected to the outlet. So that means that all of the water will have to flow over the pervious section. So using this, and the total impervious area is 30% of the watershed. So if we go from 30% up, and intersect this point one. Now, take a horizontal line. That's the green line that's on the screen right now. So you can sketch it with your pencil just to get a sense for where things are and not just rely on what you're seeing on the screen. So a horizontal line that goes over from 100% is unconnected, 30% impervious area. So 30% is that vertical line there. So we go over and then intersect what curve number is it for the section that's pervious. And so 60% is pervious. So the point of intersection is the green line and then this angled black line that goes along with 60%. So then the line downward to get the composite curve number is this purple one that I've just put on. So going downward, then you can see that the weighted composite curve number is 65. So it's the same 30% impervious. Up here, we said it would be 72 was the curve number. It's just the positioning of the asphalt in the watershed changes what composite curve number we should use. So if it's directly connected, it would be 72. If it's not directly connected, then the composite curve number would be 65. So you can go all the way up to the 60? That's right. You intersect it with this curve that corresponds to 60 for the pervious area, and then the composite weighted curve number would be 65. Any questions about that? So on the one hand, I want you to be able to use this nomograph, and then on the other, I'd like you to be able to explain why it exists in the first place. What are the principles behind this nomograph? All right, so um, use the nomograph and what we've talked about to solve this example, where it is partly connected and partly unconnected.
All right, so it looks like it's what? 62, 4, 6, 8, 68. It follows that line down to the composite curve number area and gives us a, a, a weighted average of 68 if it's half and half unconnected impervious versus connected pervious. Any questions? Okay. So those are just a couple of the factors that we need to be aware of for changing how curve number impacts can, curve number can be uh, adjusted and impacted based on the watershed or the precipitation distribution. Uh, before we finish up, I'll just remind you about your next homework assignment, which is due on Monday. So you've got the weekend to work on that. And uh, that's it. Have a nice weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.